Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to this um, opera talk. Uh, and uh, I want first to thank um, Linda Hirschman and, um, for supporting this opera talk. And I would like to thank all the patrons that have made uh, this production and these opera productions here, annual opera productions at Bard, possible. It is, um, it's a tribute to that patronage that it permits us to do repertoire that is not uh, conventionally available or usually available uh, to opera-going audiences. And so it's a distinct honor and pleasure to be able to do it. So, um, Uh, this uh, opera, uh, I think, is our ninth uh, next year. Uh, we are going to do the Orestia by Sergei Taneyev. Um, I can tell from the response that it's a favorite. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the subject of next year's festival is Stravinsky, and um, so um, in looking for an opera that fit with the general subject, um, as we did this year. Um, the Rake's Progress is spoken for around the world uh, very effectively, and um, the Rimsky operas have been um, very brilliantly pioneered by, um, by Valery Gergiev. And uh, so the question and the Tchaikovsky operas are largely spoken for and are in the repertory. So um, Taneyev was a student of Tchaikovsky's and a fabulous composer. And this is, uh, was done in the Kirov in the 1890s. It's a setting of Aeschylus's Orestia. It's a fantastic dramatic opera and shows you a side of Russian culture and literature uh, that is, doesn't fit with a caricature of what we consider to be Russian. And um, it's a brilliant piece. And this is its first full production since its premiere. So um, it is a real discovery. So. To this afternoon's uh, event, uh, Le Roi Marguerite Louis uh, is, um, has uh, the following reputation. Uh, it was, um, when it was pre premiered in 1887, and then revived later, Albert Carré made a version of it, um, it was, uh, for Chambrier, a reasonable success. Uh, and uh, it um, was a comedy, and comedy is a much harder to do than tragedy. Um, uh, tragedy uh, can descend into the sentimental and pathetic very effectively uh, without embarrassment. But if you miss it in comedy, it's deadly. And uh, so uh, it was a comic opera. It was written uh, by Toul de Bredis with Chabrier's help. And in that sense, it's a pastiche. Uh, despite its, its um, merits, it was viewed as being um, hard to understand and uh, uh, not terribly effective. Uh, and the, the general view was that the libretto was at fault. And uh, uh, so, uh, but the score had this incredible reputation. Uh, Chabrier was um, initially um, viewed by many as an amateur and turned to musical composition only late, later in life. Um, he was a fantastic pianist, and um, both in popular and serious genres, and uh, was very friendly with um, the whole um, uh, literary and musical scene of his day in Paris. And uh, uh, he, um, he ended up uh, having, like Chausson, a fantastic art collection. Uh, and um, he, um, after uh, making the decision to devote himself to, to composition, he focused largely on the operatic genre. Uh, there is a great um, uh, neo-Tristan opera, Gwendoline, and um, uh, the city opera has done in New York, L'Etoile, uh, Briseis, which actually Strauss conducted the first premiere, which was never completed. And then what uh, many people regard to be his masterpiece, um, uh, Le Roi, uh, Roi Marguerite Louis. Uh, this, um, the opera, um, 
as a composer, partially because there was this slight prejudice against him as an amateur, which he was not, um, by very, um, uh, very pretentious um, colleagues like Vincent Dandy, um, who founded an alternative school to the Paris Conservatory, the Scola Cant Cantorum, and was very much devoted uh, to the training in counterpoint and um, harmony uh, in a very uh, disciplined way. Um, when he sat down to write this opera, um, in part, he wanted to demonstrate uh, his skills as a composer in the um, development of musical ideas, in the orchestration, and in the harmonic usage. And the score, as a result, is brilliant from beginning to end in a way which astonished um, fellow musicians. The most famous uh, comments about it are from Ravel, who said the opening bars changed the course of French harmony. Um, um, the Germans, who were very um, uh, niggling about their praise of anything French, um, uh, thought very well of it, Strauss himself. And, um, and finally, um, uh, Stravinsky, who considered this to be a pearl and uh, was always angry that it had been dismissed because of the presumed stupidity or incomprehensibility of the, of the libretto. Um, there is a moment in this opera, people say in every textbook will tell you that Chabré was very much overtaken uh, or overwhelmed by, um, by his encounter with Wagner. So a step backwards. Uh, there's no doubt that after the debacle of Tannhäuser in, in 1861 in Paris and the publication um, by Baudelaire of, um, of a defense of Wagner, um, v Wagnerism became a, um, um, a, a mantle of, um, of French progressive artistic thinking. And the Revue Wagnerienne became the single most important French intellectual publication. And Wagner's influence, uh, primarily felt in poetry, um, began to extend itself in music. And there was a whole generation of French composers overwhelmed uh, by the Wagnerian example. Now, what is the Wagnerian example? The Wagnerian example was not what we consider today Wagner. That is to say, it was not about the myth Although, for example, uh, Chausson, who has a great opera, which I've had the pleasure of recording and performing, Le Roi Artus, the King Arthur, is very Wagnerian both in its choice of subject, that the Arthur legend, and in its treatment, although quite distinctive. And Debussy always criticized his friend Chausson for the excessive Wagnerism of the opera. Um, the fact is the Wagnerian influence is more to be found in Debussy and Chabrier in a different way, and that is the conception of how music tells a story and how music creates a mood or a sensibility and how music interacts with text. So it has little to do with the enormity of the contraptions that you see in the ring or the overblown, uh, pretentious, um, hammer striking profundity, which Wagner wants to persuade you uh, of in the encounter with him. Um, it had nothing to do with that grandiosity. It had to do with the nature of music. Wagner's real innovation was to transform classical and early romantic musical language into a very large scale mechanism by which things could be illustrated narrated, and one's perception of reality could be expanded. It was a transformative um, way of bringing you out of the normal time frame of our daily lives into a magical, imaginary space. And that space was driven by the structure of musical time and the way music made a continuous story or a continuous sense of time. And Wagner's primary innovation was repetition and harmonic usage. So uh, Debussy takes it one way. Chambéry takes it in another way. In this particular example, he invests a French tradition of grace, 
light opera, Offenbach, and a kind of uh, affectionate exoticism, characteristic you see it in Carmen, in Bizet, and in Jamile of Bizet, and takes the lightness and the grace, which is a French conceit, and invests it with Wagnerian approaches to musical composition. There's a very interesting moment, which will pass by very quickly, and that is when the tenor role here, Nongis, in sort of being told very rapidly by Henri about the plot that is the center of the opera, Nongis being a tenor and therefore not the smartest person. Uh, <laughs> tenors have a nasty habit of being cast. There's a famous anecdote between Strauss and Hofmannsthal when the writing of Ariadne of Naxos, the composer in the prelude was supposed to be a tenor, which was turned into a trouser role by the composer, and Hofmannsthal was taken by surprise. And Strauss replied, if you can find me a tenor smart enough to impersonate a composer, I'll change it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but Nangis, uh, we have a very smart tenor, but the role is not that. So Nangis says to, says to uh, Henri, I don't get it. What are you talking about? I don't understand. I'm lost. And in those two bars, Strauss, um, uh, Chabre collapses the harmonic usage you find in the opening of Tristan into two very compact bars and modulates from implied A major to A flat major. Sliding through, your ear thinks, where am I going? I'm lost. Perhaps I'm going to C major, and he ends up in A flat major. Now, this is an absolute Wagnerian indensity in Nuce, in very great detail. And throughout the entire opera, in the opening of the second act, in the big dance sequence, which is absolutely uh, had a huge influence on Ravel's La Valse, and also probably was known to Strauss when he was writing Rosenkavalier, that um, um, the same harmonic imagination uh, that he borrowed from Wagner is put in the service of a very light, distinctly French comic tradition. And um, the other uh, real innovation was taking a fresh look at the orchestra. So the opera is is designed for a very sophisticated audience in a way because the opera refers to many examples. There, uh, there are um, echoes of Huguenots. Uh, there, there is in one moment um, uh, in the orchestra almost a direct quotation from Meister Singer. Uh, there, the history of opera sort of a little bit alluded to. And there's Berlioz as well. But he, um, he uses orchestration, instrumentation, in a completely novel way in a transparent way, uh, which um, is, is characteristic of those who studied Wagner very carefully but didn't imitate the density of the texture that Wagner excelled at. And um, so the Wagnerian in, in, in Chabrier is really in harmonic usage and in the imaginative use of orchestra and in the relationship of music to text. Um, and. Uh, uh, and he, he does a very graceful homage, not only to Wagner, but to Offenbach. There's a famous Barcarolle, um, which um, is reminiscent of Tales of Hoffman. But there's a gravity to the musical score that uh, makes this an, uh, an unparalleled jewel. It's a genuine musical masterpiece. The problem, of course, is how do you put this on the stage? And um, we're very privileged to have Thaddeus Strasberger, who did with us the um, Distant Sound, F. Anna Klang, and Huguenots with us. This is third production with us, and he will do the Tanyev with us next year. Uh, so he's a young director with tremendous visual and theatrical imagination. And um, he, um, he immediately recognized the, the virtues of the score. So the question was how to make the story work. Now, he went back to first principles. The good news about the story, unlike some comedies or farces, is that it has, the truth is always the best defense. Um, that is to say, whether it's madness or the ridiculous, uh, no novelist, um, no theater writer can be as imaginative as we are as people just living our lives. 
Uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer was once famous in having asked to somebody who asked him, how come, how did he invent such crazy and, um, and uh, ridiculous characters with such bizarre habits? Um, his answer was um, um, that um, uh, if you have to make it up, you have no talent. Uh, so, the truth in that our lives are more odd than any wacky novel that we can read. So too in this opera, there is a real story here, and the real story has to do with the uh, death of a dynasty in Poland. Poland um, was um, uh, in, um, in the um, early modern period uh, a great political power, and uh, as was Sweden. And um, it finally was dismembered in the 18th century. Part of its collapse as a nation and as an imperial nation was that it transferred from an inherited kingship to an elected kingship. And that elected kingship began with the end of the Agalonian dynasty. And in addition, in order to eviscerate the central monarchy, uh, the Polish nobility in their assembly, the equivalent of a kind of Magna Carta arrangement, the lords, the Polish nobility, decided to create a system of, of liberum veto, of being able for any single nobleman to veto the work of the group. So you had, if you think our Congress is dysfunctional, um, it has nothing to compare to the idea of one person getting up and de derailing a decision of the group. Um, and uh, so deciding who would be king, which was clearly an important decision, uh, became very difficult. And um, uh, the, the choices were not great for the Poles at the end of the 16th century. There was Ivan the Terrible, which there was a group of Russophilic Poles um, who thought that would be a good idea for their own self-interest. And then there were the Habsburgs. Ironically, both the Habsburgs and the Russians would divide Poland with the Germans, finally, at the end of the 18th century. A group, however, persuaded everybody to go for a son of Catherine de Medici, Henri de Valois, and to ask him to accept the rules of kingship in Poland and to go to Krakow to become king. Now, you have to understand, for a Frenchman, even the French are very difficult, and uh, 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 snobbery is a French privilege. And um, uh, the idea of moving to Krakow uh, was a form of exile that was unimaginable. Um, and so, Certainly, um, the idea of being elected king of Poland and having to go to Krakow was, was, um, was an exile that uh, makes Arkansas look cosmopolitan. And, um, and for those of you who may be New Yorkers, you just can imagine there are so many New Yorkers who are so provincial, they do not believe anything exists outside of the city of New York. And, um, uh, there may be good superficial reasons, but no real reason to believe that. And um, so uh, the irony, of course, is after six months or so, I think his brother dies, and um, he returns to France to become Henry III. Um, and uh, actually, he is murdered later by a, a fanatical Catholic monk. Um, but... Um, uh, and there's a lot of historical speculation of Henri de Valois. Uh, and, but in the 1880s, um, Chabry and his friends uh, took this on as a comedy. And the reason it was a comedy is several things which are relevant today, uh, which is why the reviving opera now today is not such a far-fetched idea. Number one, um, the whole idea of kingship. Uh, and uh, remember, this is the 1880s. It's after the Franco-Prussian War. It is during the Third Republic and where there is um, a tremendous amount of Republican sentiment. There's a huge monarchical right wing. And so this is a way of poking fun on who the hell are these kings. I mean, you just have to take a look at the British royal family to be glad that they're purely symbolic uh, in their influence. And um, so the idea of, of, of monarchical royalty is a monarchical power is the arbitrariness and the bizarreness of it. And um, so that was one spoof, and that's 
transparent. The other spoof, of course, was that with the dismemberment of Poland in the late 18th century, the French, po after the revolution, but even am among the philosophes, um, they developed a huge empathy for the Poles. The French were um, wildly uh, uh, attracted to the Polish romanticism about their lost nation. And um, this finds Rousseau, for example, was from Geneva, but still a major French intellectual figure, obviously, wrote a constitution of Poland. Uh, Napoleon was a great Polish hero because he recreated the Grand Duchy of Warsaw and was considered a patron, rightly or wrongly, of the cause of Polish independence. Then you have, of course, the romance and reality around Chopin's exile in Paris and his uh, centrality in French um, intellectual circles of the time. And then there's a long romance with the cause of Poland. And um, uh, despite the alliance of the French and the Russians in the First World War, uh, the question of the independence of Poland uh, was a, a recurring um, um, dream, if you will, uh, in among uh, many French. And, um, but at the same time, uh, Chabré was not a stranger to the uh, consequences of European imperialism. And European imperialism, which is the conquest of Africa and, uh, and the, the carving up of China and the, uh, the travels to the Far East, um, that British and French imperialism and German and Belgian imperialism uh, had an unusual reverse impact on domestic politics in Europe. And the two most important ones were anti-Semitism, which was the, the turning back of racism um, of, of, of a kind of imperialist kind back home to the domestic population, and also nationalism, kind of stereotypes of national superiority, French versus German versus Spanish versus English, um, and all the European countries traded in them. And the legacy of that we find in Europe today. Um, the rebirth of a kind of virulent nationalism is actually uh, a fact on the ground in Europe today. In addition, the claims of European unity, of a common cause, uh, post-Napoleonic alliances with the defeat of Napoleon, Napoleon, and most now in our own time, the European community and the Eurozone, um, you know, how is there a real constituent for Europe? Are there people on the ground who feel themselves European um, and we see in the economic crisis now that those senses of solidarity are weak. And that's a major subject of this opera, Les Polonais and Les Francais. You know, so here is this French guy going to become a king of Poland and the sense of national difference. Um, one of the key characters is an Italian count. So Chabré and his colleagues make fun of, of these kinds of conceits. So everybody gets skewered here, the French, the Poles, uh, national sentiment uh, gets taken slightly to the cleaners. And um, all in good fun. Uh, so the advantage of this comedy is that it's, um, it's based on a real circumstance. Now, of course, they embellish the circumstance. And Thaddeus brilliantly has embellished it even further. So that um, the plot revolves around um, uh, you know, star-crossed lovers. Uh, there is um, uh, the king himself, who ends up having had a relationship with the wife of his chamberlain, uh, who is Polish, and then there is his best friend, Nangis, who is involved with a Polish girl. And um, um, th the lovers quite don't make it. Uh, we've added, uh, Thaddeus added a brilliant stroke in making Alexina pregnant and you wonder through the whole opera who is the father. Um, at the end, uh, the implication is clearly that it's Henri de Valois. Uh, this is added to make the, the, the story clearer. What's very important in this, uh, <laughs> um, uh, this is before DNA testing, so uh, it's all a matter of speculation. Um, but what's important here too is that um, what, um, um, uh, Thaddeus and Yule Eberwein have done in the dramaturgy is to, in a creative way, restore the dialogue. In the opera comique, in, 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 in um, 
In Paris, there was a, uh, it was not Wagnerian in the sense, in its form. This is not a Wagnerian opera in form. It's not a continuous musical fabric. Uh, there are there are spoken dialogue. There are set arias, set duos. It's not a. Um, it, it, it um, in that sense, stops and starts. And in between, what continues the story is dialogue. And uh, so you will see dialogue and acting. Um, what's very important is that uh, we have several native French speakers who are in the cast, both Canadian and French. But in the tradition of Jean, uh, Jean Siebert, um, since many of the characters are Polish, um, um, the, um, the unusual and charming French accents are part of the drama. And, um, uh, and so, uh, for those of you who are snobs about accents, um, I forewarn you. Uh, first of all, the standardization of speech is a late 19th century phenomenon at best, and is a modern conceit. Um, uh, it's um, hard to realize the amount of variation, both in spelling and pronunciation, that existed in all of our languages. Uh, so everything you're going to hear on stage is historically period accurate. <laughs> and uh, so, um, uh, the, um, uh, so the, the work is truly um, um, a neglected jewel. It always, it always uh, you know, people uh, who who fight for a repertoire that is not standard um, often are accused of trying to make an argument for something that the test of time hasn't proven uh, to be worthy of it. This is a totally um, not an accurate assessment of how our repertoire comes into being. Our repertoire comes into being for many reasons, many of them accidental, political, uh, some sheer laziness, ignorance, um, and uh, convenience. Um, <clears throat> The fact remains is that uh, most of the works that uh, we, we revive and others revive around the world really are worthy of revival. Uh, and um, the definition of worthy of revival, it, it bears repetition. Uh, and um, um, it, it's not a curiosity. Uh, you're in for a, a wonderful evening, uh, afternoon, uh, of, um, of music and of theater. And uh, so um, I would like actually to um, the rest of the hour to turn the questions over to you because you've come all this distance and you probably want to know something or have, I can talk at great length um, <laughs> with very little prompting. So I would prefer, however, uh, to respond to things that you have on your mind. I will repeat the question, so don't worry if you don't hear it. And as I say often, if I don't like the question, I'll just change it. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, the question as to what the theory of the reverse of imperialism, um, so colonialism, the colonial, and what its impact in domestic European politics. So this is, uh, it's not an original thought to me, but it is a view that many historians maintain. So when the English, for example, um, and the French, and then the Germans and the Belgians, um, colonized Africa, and colonized, they conquered Africa, and then, um, uh, and, and, and uh, in Asia particularly. And also, uh, one can count to some extent uh, the uh, Spanish and Portuguese conquest of, of, of this hemisphere. That um, the conquest of a people's viewed as different. For example, take the Native American Indian. The Native American, the discovery of a native population in the so-called New World had a huge impact on the development of European political theory. So if you read Locke, Hobbes, the Native Americans were viewed anthropologically as primitive examples of what we must have been like a long time ago. So the influence of the image of another world um, has a huge reciprocal influence on the development of the home culture. It isn't only about thinking oneself superior, it's redefining who you are in relationship to this expanded universe 
of, of control and power. So, the, um, so without, let's say, the subjugation of the African slave, the definition of white superiority would never have developed in its elaborate form the way it did. That's a simple example. In the European case, it fueled a resurgence of modern anti-Semitism so that the subordinate oriental person at home was the Jew, which was a new twist on an old tradition of Christ-killer anti-Semitism, for example, which was a religious based, based on a claim about a historical event having to do with the birth of Christianity. So <clears throat> racialism, racial superiority, the, uh, the, the transfer of Darwinian thought uh, to uh, social judgment about race, um, was fueled by the apparently pseudoscientific confirmation of superiority between primitive and civilized races and of differences between the Oriental and the Western, but then um, got turned home uh, to a reconsideration of the dominant minority next to you at home. It didn't have to be in Africa. So that's the, then it also fueled the way in which uh, people began to think about what was distinctive about themselves. It's a way of thinking. Um, so German chauvinism, French chauvinism, uh, Russian nationalism, for example, gets developed in opposition to uh, the German Russian nationalism in the late 19th century has a lot to do with the Russian conquest of the Central Asian tier, for example, um, and the development of, uh, of sensibilities of, of what was uniquely Russian. So that's what I mean. Uh, so that's the historical process in which this opera uh, takes its form. Yeah. Not <laughs> but I saw in the program that this is a co-production with uh, the Wexford yes. Opera. I was wondering, is this the first art college thing that has been a co-production, and how did it come about? Where did it begin? Oh, so um, the questioner asked, they noticed that this is a co-production with Wexford. And indeed it is. And the question is whether this is the first co-production Bard Summerscape has had. This is the ninth opera, and uh, this is the first co-production. The answer is yes. Uh, the co-production is a function of many years of trying to get other opera houses to take the work we've done and, frankly, help pay for the production costs and also make it live beyond. So if you look back at the operas we've done, for example, I, I feel... It's sad that, there, for example, the Schumann Genoveva, uh, which was done by Caspar Holten from Denmark, now the director of Covent Garden, that a beautiful set and wonderful production just died, went into storage. Um, the same as Raphael Vignoli's The Nose, or uh, his Liebe der Danai, or the... Um, or Judy Fath Regina. These are, these are beautiful productions with fabulous costumes and uh, direction worked out in dramaturgy, which should be seen in other houses. So we've worked very hard, but we were the new kids on the block doing repertory nobody knew, and nothing is more averse than the Opera House. Uh, opera House is among the most conservative uh, instruments. So Opera Houses like to do the standards, which are always quite the same, and then every once in a while a new opera. But reviving historical opera is a very tough task to convince. So through personal connections, um, uh, we were able to persuade Wexford, which is a very forward-looking opera house. And we hope in the future to have other co-productions with other houses willing to take uh, what we finally decide is the one opera that we think is worthy of being produced on a full-scale basis. So this is the first time it's happened, yeah. It was Bard's initiative, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, is the dialogue being done in French or in English? And also, there are several editions of the score out there, and which one did you choose? Well, I, 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 my knowledge of the various editions of the score is limited. So what we are using is the uh, first complete printing in 18, in the, the, of the 1887 version. So... Um, uh, there was a version, for example, there are some that I heard about, but uh, where the, 
some music is transposed from one act to another, but we are doing the original 1887 score. The dialogue is also taken with some painful reconstruction from that period, but it's been shortened and altered and amended to fit modern circumstances and also um, the way the opera, the way the characters are, are dramaturgically organized. So um, the, di the question is, wh where did the dialogue come from and what version of the score are we using? So we're using the 1887 um, complete score, not the Carré version, which is the only other edited version that I know. And um, in addition, uh, the, um, the dialogue is in French. So we thought about shifting um, uh, languages. So there are several problems with shifting languages. We've done it in other circumstances. We did it when we did the Schumann Manfred, for example. But the reason we did the Schumann Manfred is because Schumann used a, a German translation of Byron. Now, for an English-speaking audience, to use a German translation of Byron is, is an odd thing. Um, so um, Byron is hard enough for modern-day listeners to tolerate that uh, might as well stick to the English. So there we did the dialogue in English but the singing in, in German because uh, in our view with the existence of supertitles, which is um, uh, a new phenomenon relatively, um, the, the need to sing in the native language of the audience is gone and also that uh, composers, good composers, are invariably attuned to the sound of the language. So to translate the singing will damage the, the musical line. Um, even though, ironically, with the advantage of supertitles, the quality of diction from the opera stage has collapsed completely. Uh, so they could be singing Esperanto most of the time. Not in this house, but in many houses. Um, You know, it's fascinating. You, you know, you know, on, if you spend a lot of time in the car and you listen to satellite radio, one of the joys of satellite radio are the Met broadcasts, especially the historic broadcasts. And they have an endless amount of material. And it's fascinating to listen to, I heard a Tale of Hoffman broadcast um, with Eugene Ormandy in the pit from the 50s. And I turned on, turned on the middle, and what's amazing is in the days before supertitles, the diction from the stage was very impressive. As you get more to the supertitle time, it's hit and miss. Uh, there are long stretches of the ring that um, God only knows what they're singing. It's not so bad. <laughs> it's not so bad because Wagner's German is so repulsive that... Um, <laughs> that um, it it's, um, it's, would be hard to actually confront it in all its gory accuracy with all the alliteration, I mean, it's just incredibly bad. Um, so, but um, interesting, it's variable, and uh, it's most harmful in, uh, it's less audible uh, with women voices than with male voices. Um, <laughs> but... Um, in any event, uh, even if the diction isn't that great, um, the musical line gets damaged uh, often by translation. Now, when you get to dialogue, um, given in this opera and its nature, since you have an international cast, if you did it in English, you'd have a lot of funny-sounding English on the stage. And since there are a lot of Poles speaking French, why not stick to the funny-sounding French? Uh, <laughs> And uh, with supertitles, you can, you can get the task done. The problem with comedy, of course, is that the timing of supertitles is much more sensitive than in tragedy. Um, uh, you can ruin a joke. Uh, I, 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 there was a production of uh, Ariadne uh, where the, the jokes of the major domo were said to the audience before he said them. I felt very sorry for him. <laughs> they started to laugh before he spoke. And... Um, uh, and that's very, and that's extremely demoralizing. Uh, but, um, so yes, the dialogue is in French, is in French. Uh, yeah. You said that this was relatively accessible by Chuck Grace standards, but what were the statistics? That I don't know. Uh, 
So uh, I think it had a, a reasonable run. I don't know, actually, I'm always impressed by the question is how often was it done in his time? It was done frequently enough for him to feel that it was a relative success. Um, but it's interesting, uh, in researching the, the, the career of the Saint-Saëns operas, that, you know, it's like Broadway in a way. How often it's done is a relative statistical matter. So if someone says, you know, this was a good Broadway production and it ran for 75 performances or 125 performances, it sounds impressive until you compare it to Phantom of the Opera and that looks like a failure. Um, so at the extremes, it didn't close after five performances, and, um, but it wasn't uh, as successful, let's say, as Huguenot, uh, which was done thousands of times. So um, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, 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 it was a reasonable success. Yeah. No, it was done once at Juilliard by Manuel Rosenthal in the 70s as a Juilliard uh, school, opera school production. This is the first professional stage production of the United States. Yeah. There's an opera, Jules of the Madonna, by Will Ferrara. Yeah. Okay, so there are a variety of operas. The question asked about an opera by uh, Emmanuel Wolf Ferrari. And um, so there are composers, Wolf Ferrari, one of them, whose career, um, uh, another one is Eugen Dalbert. Uh, there are a variety of very successful opera composers whose careers have been damaged by a mixture of the shifting tastes. Wolf Ferrari lived at a time when the style in which he wrote was decreasingly fashionable. Um, and then um, his own life and career, uh, for a variety of political reasons, um, uh, allowed he, all of his music, really, to fall into obscurity. Um, but um, it's not a work I know, but I'd be happy to take a look at it. Um, the scores are easily to obtain now. One of the great things about... I believe you. Um, and... Um, <laughs> And I, and I think there is a long list, we are accumulating a long list uh, of things that we would like to do. And um, uh, the idea of Vaux Ferrari um, has appeared on our, on our proverbial screen before. So he is a composer definitely worth looking at, um, as is Eugen Dalbert. Um, and so uh, the tragedy is that the, uh, the um, I was recently talking to a very distinguished journalist who uh, suggested not the Village Romeo and Juliet, but um, another opera by Delius. There are um, a, a very, there is a very large supply. One of the great operas, French operas, that needs to be revived is one of the last Massenet operas, Ariane. Um, and so there is a, a really an unbelievable supply of, of, of great operatic literature. Yeah. Probably not. I, my guessing is that it's much later. If, in any way, it's the other way around. In other words, this is 1887. So Verdi was already a, a senior gentleman. And I thought, and except for Falstaff, seems to have lost his comic sensibility. Yeah. Uh, the question of recording, um, what we do now is, um, what we may do as we've done with Huguenots and Def Anna Klang is that they are then eventually available on an MP3 file over the internet. In other words, if you go um, to your computers and you uh, either Spotify or Amazon Music MP3 downloads and you t type in the American Symphony, you'll see we have about almost 200 uh, MP3 files of live performances, and of the operas, I think uh, three are there, Ferneklang, Liebe der Danai, and um, Huguenots. Is uh, the, uh, the Medicine of Elijah is not there, but I think St. Paul is. Question, yeah. yeah. This uh, opera has the big roles of Barrett and Rothlein. How 
Yeah. That's a very good question. The question is whether or not, it's an, a very interesting question. It has to do with how composers set leading roles. And the questioner says, if Henri had been a um, tenor, would the opera have had a different career? Now, I, I, I think that um, uh, each of us can think rapidly about this question. Um, there is a certain tradition in Italian opera, and bel canto opera, which um, favors the tenor. You know, you remember the three tenors, right? And um, I once had lunch with one of the promoters who wanted to pick my brain to see what other threes they could roll out. <laughs> so we went through a whole three cellists, three violinists, three mezzos, <laughs> no, three sopranos. Um, uh, so the, the popularity of the tenor sound is, I think, very Italian, very Italian. So if you think even of Carmen, what draws you to Carmen are really, yeah, Don Jose is, is an important role, but really Carmen, and also the, um, the most famous tune is the Toreador. And I mean, nothing he sings, I mean, he's not a very attractive, and a, you know, a mama's boy and a narcissist, but, um, um, <laughs> But, you know, but in the end, and he kills her. I mean, it's it, nothing to, you know, tell your mom about. Uh, and so I'm not sure that, and the Germans have always had trouble with the tenor roles. You know, uh, Strauss never managed. Um, it was always a hard, the tessituras are high, the demands are enormous, um, except for Siegmund and even Lohengrin and... Uh, and Tannhäuser are, um, but possibly. But at the same time, in this opera, Nangis, who is a tenor, has a very prominent role. And he gets a lot of great music, and the big love duet is a soprano tenor duet. So I don't think, no. I, I, every once in a while, an opera is written for a specific singer, who might be a tenor, and who then carries it forward. Um, but I don't think that the casting in that regard would have affected the future of the opera. Where? Yeah. Yes, please. So who, who had his or her hand raised? Okay, go ahead. Please. Repeat the question once again. So, so opera starts in Italy, Italy, yes? And in this opera, the Italian couple is a couple. Yes, yes. Uh, so, in a Fratelli, so the, the questioner asks about. If I understood the question that opera, since its origins are in Italy <clears throat> and there is an Italian on stage who is cuckolded, um, and is, that, um, is there something significant about it? Well, I, I, I would say that being cuckolded is not a national privilege. Uh, <laughs> so why? Wow. And the Italians probably carry it with greater humor and grace than the Germans, uh, and uh, <laughs> so um, it's an interesting question about uh, betrayal on the opera stage and how it's what its meaning and origin is. Um, in this opera, uh, Fritelli is a very likable character and um, wonderfully played in this production. And um, uh, he's proud of his being Italian. Uh, I don't think it has a lot of significance, no. Um, 
And, uh, you know, Betrayed Lovers is a stock of all of opera. So it's so commonplace as a plot trick that, um, uh, and, uh, I mean, betrayed women really are, are a necessary instrument on the operatic stage. Uh, and so I, I don't think that it has any particular um, significance. I, I would guess not. I would guess not. Yeah. What? The third time, I mean, when, when he sings, you know, about, um, about the Polonais and himself and on Pologne. No, what's interesting about that third act is that um, when he sings about the Poles, the music is a habanera. <laughs> so um, that's his joke, you know. Um, so I think it's, it, the opera, if anything, deconstructs a terrible word. Uh, under undercuts uh, ethnic stereotypes, even in music. Yeah. Well, can you tell us anything about Spanish opera? Spanish opera. Uh, um, no. Uh, uh, I. I I know that it exists. Uh, I know that uh, I know that it exists, uh, but I, I don't think that I actually have ever looked at a Spanish score uh, of opera score. Um, I know that they exist, and uh, it's worth looking into. Uh, I've looked at the Ginastera operas, but that's Argentinian, and um, uh, there are Villa Lobos operas. That's Brazilian. Uh, but no, I can say that, um, I'm trying to think whether I've looked, uh, there certainly are. I, the gentleman will tell you momentarily. So why don't the two of you get together during the break? <laughs> if you want to talk politics, I'm happy to talk politics too. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Well, it's a very good question. You know, when the Germans invaded 19, in 1939, there was a, a joke in Paris where, which was question, mourir pour Danzig, or when the Germans took over Danzig before, 39, before the invasion. Um, um, uh, well, there's very many explanations for this. Uh, first of all, as you, as you say yourself, the Pol Poland was divided uh, between the, the Germans, the Prussians, and the... Um, Russians and uh, Galicia to the Austrian-Hungarians. There was an intellectual um, in the so-called Young Poland movement and a tremendous affinity to the French. The same goes for the nationalist movements in Hungary, in Budapest. So the Hungarian poet Andr Adi, uh, Boy Zelensky, for example, was the translator of Proust. The French intellectual, Szymanowski, uh, spent time in Paris. Um, uh, the, um, to them, France represented, and Napoleon represented, democracy, freedom, independence. And um, so the, the Poles and the French and the Hungarians and the Romanians as well, Enescu, for example, uh, who spent time in Paris. Paris became somehow I mean, the Germans were the enemy to some extent. Uh, they were militaristic, uh, although the, the, the composers were deeply influenced by Strauss, primarily in the turn of the century and the late 19th century, also by Wagner. The France seemed, first of all, was not on their border and not threatening to them. Uh, despite Pan-Slavism, the Russians, first of all, there was the religious difficulty. The, po the northern Germans were Protestant. The Austrians were Catholic, uh, certainly, but the French were also Catholic, and the Poles are Catholic, and the Russians are Orthodox. 
So the religious difference, although some of the Ukrainians are Catholic, a different kind of Catholicism, fact remains that, um, so the affinity uh, by religion and by literary sentiment, uh, Polish romanticism in poetry uh, was deeply um, uh, also connected to French literary movements. And um, finally, you have to give some credit to the legend and reality of Chopin, who was a major figure in French culture and in Polish culture. So, and the French nobility, as the Russians, spoke French. Um, and so, for a variety of intellectual reasons, uh, the influence um, of the French intellectual and political legacy was very, very powerful among Eastern, burgeoning Eastern European nationalisms. And it was a tremendously romantic cause. I mean, um, uh, the, 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 the um, revolution of 1830, and then in the late 19th century, there were several incidents. Um, there was one in Vrzeszyn, there was a suppression by the Germans of school children learning the Polish language. There was an attempt both on the Russian and the German side, not on the Austrian side, but on the Russian and German. The Austrians maintained the Polish nobility, so Czartoryski and others sat in the Polish parla in the, in the, in the Habsburg parliament. But there, the, the treatment of the Polish nobility, noble class, in Austria-Hungary was much more respectful. But in the Russian and German case, there was a really deep effort to suppress the Polish language and by Russification and Germanization. And that appealed uh, very much also as an intellectual cause, as a, if, the moral equivalent of a human rights cause today. Yeah, yeah John in the back. Uh, since you seem to specialize in forgotten operas of yeah. the past, are there any American operas of the past that interest you? Like many, many, many. Like what? So, <laughs> I'll refer you to the guy who knows about Spanish opera. No, <laughs> yeah. no, no. Uh, so, um, there are several um, uh, American operas. The question has to do with uh, rare operas. First of all, my, my support of forgotten music is my general affection for underdogs. Um, you know, we're very cruel because increasingly our cultural life uh, imitates our manner of thinking about the Olympic Games. You know very well, we are in the midst of Olympic Games, I understand, and if anybody ever gets remembered, it's not the person who wins the gold medal. That's not good enough. You have to win many gold medals to be remembered. The person who wins the silver medal is not in our consciousness. The person who wins the bronze medal is not in our consciousness, and the person who came close is totally anonymous, could, by the, could be the person next door. Totally anonymous. However, if you watch the person who are in the top 50, top 60, whatever the Olympic sport is, these people are so fantastic at what they do that it's mind-boggling. We know about Roger Federer, right? But if you go to a name that isn't selling you clothes, but is ranked 110th in the world in tennis, that player is so fantastic. And that player probably could have beat Don Budge today. Now, we who are musicians and writers and artists went into this line of work because it's not about Olympic sports. It's not about metrics. It's not about the 10 best. It's not about gold medals. It's not about the best pianist, the best composer. If that's nonsense. That's a, that's a claim of ignorance. Yet, we have eroded all of our memory of the great music that has been written in the last 200 years, especially for the large-scale ensembles. And um, this is a, an insult to our own achievement as human beings. There's nothing that needs defense of these works. It is a tragedy that we are one of few organizations fighting on their behalf. So it isn't simply um, because the obscurity is there. There's no justification for it. And we are fighting a, a fight against the erosion of history in an art form which is the greatest sense, the greatest cause in my view, 
for our pride in our species. So, when you get to American opera, I can think of the following. Uh, one which is very unpopular, but I believe in, and that's Roger Sessions' Montezuma, which is probably the great 20th century modernist opera. There's The Emperor Jones by Louis Grunberg. Um, the, um, there are the operas of Hugo Weisskall other than Esther. Um, so uh, there is, uh, there's Bernard Herrmann's Wuthering Heights, which was done last year, the year before, in, um, in I think, in the Midwest. Uh, so there is indeed a tradition of, of American opera. We did one, which is uh, the Blitzstein Regina. Uh, but there is indeed a tradition. There is uh, the comic operas of Lucas Foss. Uh, there are... Um, there are indeed, excuse me, the Ballad of Baby Doe. Ballad of Baby Doe is revived. That is revived. That, that's an opera that actually comes back more than periodically in the repertory. Um, so uh, I'm not saying there aren't American operas that are on the stage. There are Samuel Barber's operas. There are uh, the Menotti operas come back and, uh, um, periodically. So um, there is... Um, there is indeed a, a tradition of American opera that um, uh, goes back to the turn of the century. Uh, there is an opera by, um, by Horatio Parker uh, that is um, uh, Ives' teacher. Uh, so these, the, 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 it bears looking into. Uh, and um, our choice of opera is usually guided by the composer that is the figure of the Bard Music Festival. And, um, so next year is Stravinsky, the following year is Schubert. And uh, so we're in the midst of deciding of an opera there. And um, there are many choices, um, includes actually Schubert himself, uh, although his work for the theater has, is filled with, with difficulties. Um, so yes, there are American operas um, that, um, that bear looking into uh, for, for revival. One last question. Would like to. Yes. You were talking about uh, the Poland and the period after the partition and before World War II, the establishment of the state of Poland. Yes. So after the Congress of Vienna and the downfall of the Grand Duchy, uh, most of the territory of Poland went to, the, went to Russia. Yes. Uh, 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 the question is, um, and this I don't know the answer to, uh, what exactly the legal status of the Russian Tsar um, in the 19th century was. So, uh, as in Finland, um, you're probably right, I, you're, I, I assume you're right, the question asks what was the legal status. You raise a very important point that um, monarchies, of the kind that Alexander I and Nicholas I believed in, and the Habsburg Empire believed in, were dynastic, not nationalist. So in, there's a scene here uh, where Henri says, uh, Roi de Pologne, blah, blah, blah. He makes a whole list of all of his titles. And the English monarchy as well. Dynastic loyalty, loyalty to a house, Habsburg being the most famous, that the king, the emperor of Austria, was the emperor of Hungary, the emperor of, you know, he had many crowns and was emperor of many places. And people felt loyalty as the king's subject. That's a dynastic loyalty. I have no doubt that the Russian czar th sought to develop that loyalty. And certainly he had a fair amount of loyalty in the, among the Finns and some among the Poles on the Russian side who were Russophilic and believed as noblemen that they would actually, although the large, the so-called Schlachta, a large percent of the Polish population, considered itself of, of some noble birth, um, that I'm sure there were those who worked with the Russians and thought that was a good circumstance. The partition didn't happen with collaboration by Polish elites, both with the Germans, with the Austrians. The Austrians were a little more justifiable because of the nature of the monarchy. But I would say that it would be a stretch, 
And you see this particularly in Boris, in Mussorgsky's Boris, and uh, you see it through Russian history. Uh, worst offender was Stalin himself. That the Russians had very little use for the Poles and were very negative. And the, the Russian rulership um, of Poland was a very tense affair, mostly by social class, less, less among urban um, commercial elites and less among um, some landed nobility, but certainly uh, among God-fearing Catholic uh, mass of illiterate Poles, from the p church was a symbol of the continuation. Uh, so language and religion uh, made the Russian rulership very unpleasant, um, and not and also also the German less the Habsburg in Galicia, and finally among the very significant Jewish population in Russian Poland, um, the the amount of official anti-Semitism from the Tsar and from the Tsarist elites didn't make the Russians particularly um, attractive, um, and um, so uh, the young Polish movement. Uh, that developed in the end of the century, of which, for example, Jerzy Fittelberg uh, the f and uh, Mieczysław Karlowski, the composer, were members of uh, the young Polish literary and uh, intellectual movement, um, was not particularly Russophilic. Although, like the Finns, many of them had their education in Russian um, universities. And certainly, of the three dominant powers, uh, the most... Um, gracious in the flourishing of Polish culture in the end, whether by opposition or just by the nature of the territory they controlled, uh, was in the Russian side. Um, but it, um, uh, both the German and Russian control of Poland were, were destable, were, were simply inspiring of Russian, of Polish nationalism. Um, and uh, the exception here again is in the southern portion of the divided Poland. Have a very nice afternoon. Thank you.